We're filming a video about um, time crystals. Indeed we are. Hi guys, it's Illuminostic, and I want to welcome you to this video uh, where we are going to look at time crystals, which in my opinion is one of the most interesting subjects or discoveries to uh, come to us from the world of physics in the last 20 years or so, and it could explain how experiences such as synchronicity arise, at least on a mechanistic basis. And a lot of what I do on this channel is sort of based around the idea that if your science is good and your metaphysics are good, they will dovetail. They're not mutually exclusive. I want to remove the woo from spirituality. And physicists usually hate this because inevitably what will happen is that people will miscontextualize uh, the ideas from physics, uh, one of the most famous examples of that is the movie What the Bleep, where they deliberately uh, re-engineered the uh, discussions with the physicists to make it appear that they were saying things that they weren't. Uh, a lot of these scientists were actually really, really angry about it. And um, so, you know, we don't want to do that here. We are going to really try... Uh, to stay away from conjecture and make sure that we have a very clear understanding of what's being presented. Um, but I think even bearing that protocol uh, in mind, we will still find that we are successfully able to draw some correlations um, between uh, these discoveries and old hermetic wisdom and my own ideas about uh, synchronicity, uh, which, you know, in case you don't follow the channel, um, a quick summary of that, uh, is basically that I have uh, conjectured that there is a symmetry uh, on a subatomic basis that exists between our inner being and the external world. And that when we experience synchronicity, it is because we have come into a, a certain degree of harmony with the fundamental structure of the universe. Um, and that happens when you are living the way that you are supposed to uh, and um, you have expanded the parameters of your consciousness to include the more subtle manifestations of um, these sort of phenomena. So uh, without further ado, let's jump in and get some help from Physics Girl, who is an MIT graduate, a uh, very brilliant and charismatic lady. Uh, and she's going to walk us through the technical details. And then when I have something to interject, I'll pause the video and contribute. So uh, before we jump in, like share and subscribe please we are demonetized for bringing truth uh to people and speaking from the heart and so uh we do appreciate support you can find avenues uh to make contributions in the description you can join us on patreon for secret streams um and we do very much appreciate each and every one of you Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this was like a big discovery in 2021. 2012, we came up with a theory for this new phase of matter. Fast forward to 2021, physicists used one of Google's quantum computers to make a time crystal. What does that sentence mean? <laughs> I was looking back through some of the big discoveries in physics that happened last year. I don't know how I missed this one. It's crazy. Have you ever heard of time crystals? It sounds like something in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It does. Time crystals are talked about in the Doctor Who series, so you're really not far off. Oh. Do you know what a crystal is? I don't Isn't know like... what defines a crystal. Give me a crystal. Rubies. Ruby. Okay, so I'm looking up the atomic structure of rubies. Yeah. It's repeating. It looks like tiles. The pattern is repeating, but in three dimensions. This is what diamond looks like. You're looking down at atoms. Carbon, carbon, carbon repeating this way. This is what the pattern of table salt looks like. Chlorine, sodium, chlorine, sodium. But the physics definition of something crystalline, it has to do with whether the structure is repeating. We've gotten so this extraordinary grip on the fundamental laws. They're very strange, but they have a kind of internal logic and beauty. Some of the things that people at the beginning of this adventure were hoping for and had in their visions was the idea that the world embodies harmonies. They were hoping that our sense of harmony somehow agreed with what nature likes to use in her construction of the world. The idea that symmetry and mathematical perfection provide the building principles that the world embodies. Einstein was a great hero of mine, and he's played an important role in my life. 
He advanced the idea that symmetry is what's very basic to the operation of fundamental law. Consider a circle. A circle is a very symmetric object. You can rotate it around its center by any angle, and although every point on the circle may move, the circle as a whole doesn't change. And that's what makes it symmetric in the intuitive sense. You can change it, you, you can make changes on it, which might have changed it, but although they transform each part of it, don't transform the thing as a whole. The great advantage of that definition is that you can apply it in very broad context, not only to describing the symmetry of objects, but to describing the symmetry of physical laws or the symmetry of equations. The idea that the laws of physics don't change as a function of time is also a symmetry. Symmetry is a very powerful constraint on our description of the world that nature seems to respect in many ways. Okay, and so this brings us to our first insight potentially into the nature of synchronicity. Uh, I have theorized for many years that the reason that we experience synchronicity is that there is a symmetry that exists between our internal being and the external being. Uh, physicists recognize all sorts of symmetries in their work, and those symmetries apply to a realm uh, that is not quite the same as ours, although it is what our realm is made out of. And so um, the mystical idea uh, that is found throughout many, many systems, throughout many, many cultures, is that the physical is a reflection of the non-physical. And so when we find these structures in the subatomic world, it informs us of the nature of every phenomena that we experience and with a little bit of deft and you know critical careful thinking uh, we can extract all sorts of knowledge uh, from these discoveries and in this case uh, the fact that there is a symmetry that exists transtemporally uh, is support for this idea that synchronicity arises from some higher order of symmetry and even the glyph 1111, which people associate with synchronicity, is totally symmetrical. And that's one of the key insights uh, into why that glyph is what it is. Uh, and also, since we're talking about crystals and symmetry, there is an association that people intuitively make between crystals and higher consciousness or states of consciousness, which, are, uh, which arise from symmetries within our being. Also, we perceive beauty uh, based on symmetry. So a very beautiful human face is perceived uh, as such because it's extremely symmetrical. And so there are lots of interesting correlations here. Also, there is this is not the first time that some sort of trans-temporal uh, functionality has been ascribed to something in our universe. Tesseracts are shapes that have a dimension in time. And so if you are at any specific uh, point in time, you cannot perceive the entire shape uh, because part of it is always in some other time in the future or the past. Uh, so it appears that it's not um, entirely there, but it is. It's just that you can only perceive the parts of it that are intersecting with you in time. It has a pattern. So you're repeating this way, you're repeating that way, and repeating this way. So it's repeating in all dimensions. How many dimensions are there? Three. Yeah, three spatial dimensions. But there's a fourth dimension. The time. Time. But Imagine you're also repeating in your time dimension. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I know, right? No one else did either <laughs> until 2012. This was like a random thought experiment of this guy named Frank Wilczek. Frank Wilczek is a professor at MIT. I met him a couple times while I was there, a year after I graduated. So that's how recent this theory was. Like not the discovery, but the theory was in 2012. It was the year after I graduated. And he was preparing for a class on symmetries in physics. And he was like, so what if there were symmetries, not in just spatial dimensions, but in time as well? And what he thought that might look like is that you could- First, there are symmetries in time. There are repeating patterns, right? We have days, we have years, we have seasons. 
Uh, and, you know, according to the Mayans, we had much greater uh, divisions of time that repeat. Uh, what is what is really meant there is that, you know, is there some sort of structural element in time that confers symmetry? Because we already know that there are patterns in time. There are all sorts of manifestations of the repeating patterns that are born of symmetry. Uh, but one of the really powerful discoveries with time crystals is that they may actually give us a subatomic basis for understanding that. It's that microcosm, macrocosm. And what he thought that might look like is that you could conceive of a material that has some kind of state and it repeats back and forth. So just like with the crystalline structure, you know how it's chlorine and sodium and chlorine, so you're repeating back and forth. But instead, you have a material that's in one state and then a different state and then back to the first state. So like, you can imagine an object like that, right? Like a metronome. Think of state as like the left orientation in your metronome or the right orientation. Can you think of anything else? Uh, like a seesaw? Yeah, like a seesaw. Water evaporating, waterfall. Yeah, like water the water evaporating. cycle. The thing about most of those, something powers that. With the metronome, typically there's like a spring. So there's some energy going in and it's using that energy. So what, what Frank Wilczek was really imagining like a microscopic scale material that has two different states, left to right to left to right. I don't know, up to down to up to down or something. Is there any material example that is in two states like that? It's not something as big as water or as complex as a clock. Something really small in the atomic scale. Yeah, there are some things, I mean, what they ended up using were atoms that have, have spin. I didn't want to get into this yet, but I, now I want to. Do you know what spin even is? Like I started talking about this. No. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> one of those inherent properties that's so fundamental to a particle and we can see what it does. It's like, even with mass, it's hard to explain what mass really fundamentally is. We can explain what it does. It pulls other masses toward it. It affects the curvature of space-time. Speaking of this, uh, there's a really interesting theory a, a growing number of physicists are actually considering, uh, and that is that the universe that we live in is actually trapped inside of a black hole. And, you know, if you think about the fact that the, the mass of a black hole is such that it, it pulls light into it, and the light is traveling at the absolute maximum speed. So in order to outpace the light uh, with gravitational pull, uh, this pull must be greater than the speed of light. And that isn't a perfect explanation, but it's in the ballpark. Most astronomers and theoretical physicists endorse the idea that our universe started with the Big Bang. However, problems with dark matter, dark energy, and cosmic expansion have some astronomers rethinking what we know about the early universe. Our universe appears to be expanding and cooling, having originated some 13.8 billion years ago in a hot Big Bang. However, it's plausible that what we see from inside our universe is simply the result of being inside a black hole. This is one of the most fascinating and yet least discussed possibilities in modern physics. Several scientists are now considering this outlandish idea by trying to connect the singularity in the black hole with the singularity in the Big Bang. It's completely baffling, but it is grounded in sound mathematics. While it may sound strange, it could actually be the best explanation of how the universe began and what we observe today. This mass. And the same is true of spin. For a lot of particles have properties called spin. Spin is a really special property because it can change and it can flip from up to down. It can actually point in a lot of different directions, but typically when you measure it, you measure it on the up and down axis and it will just choose one or the other when you do that. That's a quantum thing. We're not gonna get into it, but for simplicity, let's imagine that our particle can only be spin, spin up and spin down. Spin, it looks like this magnetic moment. It looks like this little magnetic field coming from an electric charge going around in a circle. You'd think, like maybe it actually is the, the charged particle spinning but neutrons what's the charge of a neutron neutral. it's yeah it's zero don't have any charge and they have spin so it's so not it's, it's not simple. necessarily it's not as simple as a charge spinning or a charge going around in a circle it's gotcha. this intrinsic property that's really hard to describe makes sense okay cool so spin 
One way that I've heard spin described, uh, particularly in regards to an electron, is that there's not any spinning actually happening at all. That the um, particle is disappearing and then reappearing. Uh, how they determine that it's the same particle that reappears, um, like do they tag its toe or something, tag its ear, um, so they know it's the same one when it returns. Uh, but, you know, just for the sake of... Um, humoring them and playing devil's advocate, I guess, uh, on their behalf, uh, that that's the a more accurate description of spin is that it is the particle blinking in and out of existence. Where it goes when it's not here, uh, we have no idea. That on is something on an atomic scale that can flip back and forth. So that answers your question in a very roundabout way, but I'm glad that we did that because- I'm glad too, because I would hate to go further without knowing- Without that, knowing what spin is. The, yeah. Those. Okay, so this 2012. <laughs> Frank Wilczek's idea was imagine that there's this material where you have a state like spin up or spin down and it flips back and forth before you see my brain explode trying to finally explain what time crystals are a quick message thanks to helix for sponsoring this video you know what determines the quality of my videos more than anything whether i got a good night's sleep having a regular sleep schedule is so important to me that i will stop a movie halfway through which doesn't make me a monster kyle don't be a monster like me and stop this video halfway through. I promise I'm about to tell you about the real time crystals that we actually found. Crystals are the repeating in space. Time crystals would be something, a material that repeats states back and forth in time. That's why he called it a time crystal. Imagine you don't give it any energy. Like a metronome is using the energy you put into it. Two years later, so in 2014, a paper came out where physicists argued that this is actually impossible because of the second law of thermodynamics. Have you ever heard of that? Over time, like the entropy of the universe tends to increase. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this violation of the second law of thermodynamics uh, regarding the increase of entropy has a couple of interesting uh, ramifications, and one of those is that the universe should not exist as it does, uh, because we have systems that increase in complexity. Um, she says that, uh, you know, systems do not organize themselves, and yet that is exactly uh, the proposal of basically the entirety of science. Um, so that is a really interesting sort of paradoxical, uh, question that, um, science has not managed to confront, um, at least not to the degree that can resolve it. I also wonder about this because in general terms, it's true that, uh, systems tend towards equilibrium. That's how we know that, uh, you know, the political systems around the world agitate, uh, populations because if someone wasn't shaking the ant farm, the tendency would be for it to, uh, fall into homeostasis. And so, uh, the reality is though that, you know, I feel like a lot of people, a lot of spiritual people intuit that the universe is heading some towards some kind of equilibrium and they sort of gather from that, that it's going to be this time of perfect peace and felicity and sort of like a fifth dimensional heavenly, um, vacation from duality and the reality is that when that equilibrium is attained uh, maximum disorder and maximum chaos uh, will be the state of the universe and there will be nothing alive and there will be no order at all so um you know if that's what i was saying earlier about misappropriating these ideas from physics because i've seen people literally take that and say see we're heading heading towards perfect harmony no harmony implies tension not perfect equilibrium In perfect equilibrium there's no tension there's nothing uh but dissolution and chaos yeah, yeah. things don't order themselves the universe tends to go toward chaos overall entropy increases the gist of that law is that you can't have perpetual motion machines you can't have a wheel that just spins forever and ever you can't have i bet you could <laughs> You and all of those TikTokers <laughs> that are trying to make perpetual motion machines. Did you not watch my video on perpetual motion? <laughs> Essentially what Frank Wilczek thought of was a perpetual motion machine. And so even on a microscopic scale, it's not possible to have something like this. But then fast forward to 2020, 21, 2021, physicists used one of Google's quantum computers to make a time crystal. What does that sentence mean? <laughs> have you heard of a quantum computer? No. Really? Yeah. Oh, whoa. Okay. Guessing it either works with quantum stuff or it's really, really tiny. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely the former. 
I've never actually had to explain a quantum computer, so I wasn't ready for this. But the gist of a quantum computer is that with a regular computer, the basic unit, like the basic thing storing your information are, are bits, ones and zeros. Yeah. And they store it as like electrical setting. Even this one, even your phone, like all the processing is done with bits. That's why you have to have terabytes because you have to have trillions and trillions of bits. So that's a typical computer. With a quantum computer, the biggest difference is that the bits are called qubits. Each bit is actually a little quantum system. So that it could just be an electron or something that is so small it has quantum properties, which means you have to deal with superposition of states and interacting wave functions and tunneling, like quantum tunneling through barriers. You have to deal with that in a quantum. Okay, so a lot to unpack with quantum computers, but one thing I wanted to make sure that I mention is that, uh, you know, people are anticipating the fact that AI could be a big problem for humanity. What are we going to do with all of the jobs that are suddenly um, just gone because a single, you know, AI program can do the work of an entire skyscraper full of humans? Uh, and, you know, Elon Musk, for example, has suggested that we're going to have to put the entire planet on UBI, basically, or some people believe there's a depopulation agenda uh, to compensate for that because we have so many humans making so much waste using so many resources, and suddenly uh, most of them are totally obsolete. Um, now, when you factor in the inevitability of qu combining quantum computing with AI, uh, human consciousness will be obsolete faster than you can say entanglement. Um, I, you know, I, I haven't heard anyone talking about this yet, and it is definitely an extraordinarily complex and intimidating subject. Um, and like I said, it's probably inevitable. And if you're looking for an investment that's going to outperform Bitcoin, you know, like much more rapidly and nearly instantaneous, like wealth from a tiny investment, uh, whoever comes up with the first um, quantum uh, AI, quantum computer running an AI program, that's that's going to be incredibly profitable. Uh, and Quantum computers, one of the uh, things that they allow us to do is to communicate instantaneously over vast distances. Uh, we have actually managed to constrain um, entanglement to our purposes. Uh, with the space station, there are computers that communicate back and forth from the space station using entanglement. Um, so it's really pretty amazing, but also a bit of a, a bit concerning computer. But the idea is that if you've got interaction between all your different qubits with each other, you can have many, many different kinds of states with fewer bits. That's that's enough. <laughs> They're not user friendly. Like there's no personal quantum computers yet. But in 2021, we used a quant we <laughs> Google and a bunch of researchers used a quantum computer to make a time crystal. And the quantum computer or the bits in it became the time crystal. We're talking about like something happening on a really small microscopic scale. And where can you get one of those that you can easily control? Inside of a quantum computer. That's what the computer's made to do. So you could have these electrons that are pointing spin up and spin down and you can control whether they're spin up and spin down or whether they're interacting with each other. The qubits in Google's Sycamore quantum computer are more complicated than just simple individual electron spins, but I simplified and called them spins, so forgive me. All of this feels a little bit hard to grasp, like why this is important. All that they really did is they used 20 quantum bits inside of this computer and they set them randomly to states of up and down. So they took all these qubits and put them in a line so that they were close enough, they were closely interacting with each other, which was important. And then they made them either spin up or spin down. Spin up, down, down, up, 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 down, up. So a random configuration and then and they got them to flip. I am not gonna be able to do this. Oh my gosh, this is so hard. Yeah, but all at once. <laughs> they got them to flip to down, up, up, down, 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 up, down, and then back to the original state and back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> now the real test. And then it'll flip back to its original state, almost like it remembered something from the original state, which is what's so crazy about these things. It's like there's this inherent memory in the system of where it was and where it's going. 
this could be the substantial basis for um, something like the Akashic Record. Uh, it also, um, I think, can be assumed that if souls exist, they are going to mirror quantum systems in their behavior. And so uh, this question about how could this quantum energy retain memory such that it could uh, constrain the constituent uh, energetic parts of a soul, uh, which I think would basically be photons, um, but how could it constrain them to uh, reiterate the ego of a single human being? Uh, and this memory that these time crystals exhibit could give us potentially a, a, an explanation for how that could happen. But I said that 2014, we said that physicists wrote a paper saying this was impossible. But what's missing was that they actually sent in laser light and they like just kind of kept this laser going at it. It flipped back and forth. So it wasn't perpetual motion. So it wasn't perpetual motion because you had an input of energy. The difference between this time crystal and something like a metronome is that the time crystal didn't absorb any of the energy. So like the laser light is obviously interacting with the time crystal in some way, but it's not using any of the energy. It's crazy. That's the cool part. Yeah. Does it flip right after the laser leaves, soon after? You would think that the time crystal, this, this system, would flip states with the frequency, with every oscillation of the light, but that's not what happens. It flips every integer mul multiple of the frequencies. I actually got this part a little bit wrong. So I said the qubits are flipping with integer multiples of the frequency of the light, but it's in fact integer multiples of the length of the pulses of the light and has nothing to do with the frequency of the light. So I will link to a video or two, maybe, um, talking about the uh, Fourier um, integer sequences i don't know if that's even the correct name but basically you have an oscillating wave and then you have a line and that line is tracing um another line and so if you add uh lines to the end of each line that are also turning in a circle uh and give them all lines you can draw extraordinarily sophisticated pictures and uh it's sort of like um the uh, Fibonacci sequence set into motion and uh, this video is extremely interesting because it basically shows you how um, what is referred to in the Old Testament as the logos this vibration of waves the EMF uh, could order uh, uh, chaotic energy and give rise to creation thank you to Jared and Robert who reviewed this video and caught that error for me you know, every two or every four, which would be weird because it'd be like, you push a kid on a swing, right? And they go forward and back with every push that you do. Imagine like you push the kid and then it stays over there for three more pushes and you have to like go push the kid and it doesn't come back and then it's and then on the fourth time it swings and then it goes up there and stays again Pushing the kid on the swing and it only comes back every four times those are the weird things about this time crystal it doesn't use up any energy and it doesn't heat up the system the system stays exactly the same temperature which is very weird and then the other a weird thing is that it doesn't oscillate with the light. It oscillates with an integer multiple of the light. It did break a symmetry of the universe. Have you ever heard of that? I assume not. Nope. <laughs> it's a complicated way of saying that the laws of physics will act the same today as they do tomorrow. If you put a ball on a hill today, it will roll down. And if you put the ball on the hill tomorrow, it won't roll up. It will still roll down. Another way to talk about this is a causal functionality, which is supposed to not exist. Uh, it's something that physicists have expected to find in the past, uh, but so far, I, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any a-causal uh, phenomena, uh, except for in the case of these time crystals, because if it's not using any energy, then it's not that it is absorbing something that is influencing its behavior, and in which case it should be inert. but it seems to be acting according to programming or uh, making decisions or something that is outside of the parameters of cause and effect. Translate your system through time 
it should do exactly the same thing. But if you look at the time crystal, in one moment, it's flipping like this, and in the next moment, it's not doing that, it's flipping back. Often in physics, you come up with a theory, and then it's like 50 to 100 years before you get the thing. But in this case, the idea was conceived in 2012. The theory is only a 10 year old, and yet we have the, the discovery already. That's amazing. That never happens in physics. And in fact, in 2015, there were a couple that we thought were time crystals. Like we were close and physicists were like, we found time crystals. And then we we're like, oh, they didn't quite satisfy the criteria. They have to be a little more stable. And then fast forward nine years, you have a quantum computer doing that. That's crazy. And now there have been other time crystals. There's a time crystal made in light. Now I'm gonna like, I've given you an idea. There's a that never used to happen. And if you just consider the uh, telescopic nature of the evolutionary paradigm that, you know, we have whatever it is, 40,000 years between hunter gatherer and agriculture, and then only 10,000 years between agriculture and the development of technology, and then only 50 years between the advent of technology and the sort of modern era in computing. And, uh, and then you, you can see that there's this exponential in increase in uh, what Terence McKinnon called novelty or at least this is an aspect of it but um, certainly the uh, telescopic nature of the evolutionary paradigm and so um, you know we can assume that this will continue to increase exponentially uh, the crazy thing is that it is about to hit a point where uh, it will be happening with such rapidity that it is beyond our current conception to imagine what is going to be happening. And my guess is that that moment will be realized when quantum computing and AI intersect. Physics. And now there have been other time crystals. There's a time crystal made in light. Now I'm gonna like, I've given you an idea of what a time crystal is. Now I'm just gonna blow that wide open and be like, right. you don't even need matter. <laughs> This was really upsetting to me because she actually didn't doesn't explain the time crystal made in light and you know it's a, a fundamental assumption of the mystery school traditions um something that i realized many many years ago when i i heard that uh, all matter is light in a standing wave okay well there's only two things in the universe light and uh nothingness and void uh, and so it stands to reason that light uh, is the basis for our consciousness, is what generates our consciousness. And so um, to hear that these time crystals can exist in a state that where there is no fundamental constitution other than photons, um, and also that they seem to be um, self-modulating, uh, um, that they are apparently making decisions uh, or at least um, defying a causality and then they uh, can exist in a form of pure light. Um, it's really, really getting interesting. <laughs> this sounds like endless opportunities and really cool stuff. That's awesome. Is that what it sounds like to physicists as well? Is it sound I, more... Maybe Richard Feynman, are you familiar with his name? Yes. He wrote an entire paper that was about imagining a day when quantum computers are used to simulate physics. You have to use quantum systems to simulate the physics and learn something about it, but you are actually doing the physics. And he yeah. imagined a day when quantum computers would be used That's to do something cool. like that. And here we are. So you wouldn't hit the limits of an application. You would hit the limits of physics. Exactly. Physical. That's yeah, what, that's think, yeah. time crystals. Well, I, you could have sat me down and just told me about the 2012 theory and we could have hung out and talked about that for a little bit. It would have been fun. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, can I get back to my computer now? Unqu your normal classical computer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> happy physicsing, Levi. Thank you. That's the first <laughs> time you directed it to me. I always said, happy physicsing. I like how you said thank you. Oh, love it. She would be just a wonderful person to have uh, present during uh, an LSD trip or some kind of psychedelic experience um, of that nature. Maybe I'll, I'll get lucky. She's f pretty, pretty big, so I don't know that um, she would be willing, but I'll certainly reach out to her and see if I can uh, get a conversation going. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was mind blowing uh, for you guys as, as it was for myself. Um, please do hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon, and I will see you guys again very, very soon. Goat's vagina also produces DMT. We all yes. have DMT. Everybody has it. Yeah. yeah. And you are what you eat. Yeah, sort of, but. Don't eat the whole. Goat's vagina. <laughs> She's a goblin.